Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And this is April the 18th in the year 2014. Almost Easter. This weekend will be Easter. Last I remember it was Christmas. We just got back from China. <laughs> okay, but the weather was sure a lot different, that's for sure. Okay, but, but uh, we're going to be talking tonight on uh, different things. And if you have anybody wants to call in, feel free to do it. We love hearing from the listeners. The toll-free number to call in is 1-888-627-6008. 888-627-6008. And... We're still resting up because we had our conference, the UFO conference, and it was really, it was a smashing success, but it takes a lot of work. Julia's shaking her head no, I guess you were resting up. (laughs) Well, it took me a couple of days to recuperate. Yeah, but you said we're still resting up. There's no resting going on. Okay. You and your dive right back into work anyway. But it was a smashing success, but, you know, any kind of a conference like that takes a lot of work. And we had a wonderful staff of people who helped us. We couldn't have done it without them, and it just went off like clockwork. Everything was just so fine. We had the Last year, we had the biggest crowd ever. This year, we topped it by almost 100 people. Right. We had almost 800 people this time. At the 27th annual UFO conference, and it's the oldest in the United States, and I'm beginning to bet that it's coming up to the biggest, the way it's growing. We're pushing the envelope there. (laughs) But anyway, it was almost 100 more than we had last year, and people were really happy. There was a lot of them said it was the first time they'd ever been here to the conference. Right. And... uh, we had wonderful speakers. We, we simply we had it pretty well worked out on the seating because that was a big problem last year, the seating and the parking, because it took us totally by surprise. But uh, we had an overflow room. The main auditorium part was completely sold out before we even got there and even started the conference. And then we had an overflow room that we were putting people in, and they were happy with that. It all worked great. It did. It was just it was just better than we could have hoped for. It was just so smooth. And the parking still had a few glitches, but then had a lot of people to try to cram into the parking lot of the hotel. That's Eureka Springs. And anybody who doesn't know Eureka Springs, that's a problem with the whole city. But we're gonna that's our other thing to work on. Yeah, because Eureka Springs is called the Little Switzerland. The buildings are built on the sides of the hills. And some of them are just holding on by their fingernails. So there's not a whole lot of free space. So the hotel, though, it's got, it's got a big parking lot and the, the convention center. But still, that's the hard part is finding places to put all these cars when they've never had so many in there before. But I do want to talk a little bit about the conference because uh, we had wonderful speakers. And I think it went off without a glitch on all of that. Yes, it was absolutely wonderful. Okay. But um, one we had was Antonio Paris. And he was a little more the scientific uh, point of view. Um, He's trying to combine the science with the UFOs. And he was was part of the uh, aerial phenomena is his group. And he he's done a lot of research into those things. I'm not going to be able to read Maybe all their... Right here's the front. They're in order. Yeah, it's a little hard to read all of this. But uh, he said space science and the extraterrestrial hypothesis. But I don't think he's a true believer because he still has that skepticism in there. But, you know, Lou Roy said it's, he was a healthy skeptic. And that way he was still allowing to all the different points of view. But Antonio Paris did a lot about uh, 
science combining with the UFOs. And so that was one of our first speaker anyway. Then we had Sherry Wilde. And if you've listened to the show, we ended up having her on here twice. She's such a wonderful speaker. And the feedback we got later, everybody really liked her her presentation. She was honest and believable. Yeah, very genuine. Yeah, even though her story is very strange, but a lot of you out there who have had UFO experiences know that it's strange, and you don't want to talk to just anybody. It's very hard to tell anybody oh, about it. It, it. I I was very close to crying during her talk, and that doesn't happen very often. Mm-hmm. So she's real. Yes, yeah, she is. And uh, we published her book, The Forgotten Promise. And uh, but I knew she was a good speaker because we had her on twice. We couldn't cover it all in our show, so we had to have her come back. But uh, yeah, she did really well, and it was very well received by the audience because she had had UFO experiences since she was a child. But like a lot of you out there, she buried all of this and didn't want to think about it. But eventually it'll come back up if it's meant to do that. And she did talk a lot about these her experiences. Mm-hmm. And they said they like that. They want to have more experiencers at the show. You know, we're going for the next year. We're not going to give this up. We're, we're continuing on with Lou's dream, and we have to keep having this every year now. But the people, the audience, wanted to know if we could have more experiencers next year. So I'm going to have to go through my files and see what I can find. But Travis Walton was there, who was a definitely an experiencer. And they liked him. If you remember um, the, the movie Fire in the Sky, that was his story. And that came out, oh, several years ago. If he said back in the 70s or 80s. It wasn't that far the back. The experience happened in the 70s. Yeah, so the movie I think came it was out. in the 90s. 90s, yes, that James Garner was in it playing the part of the sheriff. But uh, when we talked to him even before we had the show, the uh, conference, he told us that Hollywood got to the story and really changed it. Because if you read his book, Fire in the Sky, it's not at all the way it came out in the movie. In the movie, it really, really turned it into a horror story. Yeah, but I liked what he said about... Um, and they did a pretty good job of depicting maybe his frame of mind, where he because he was in fear at that point, and so it was depicting that, you know, because he what he has been in fear for a very long time, and now he's just starting to realize the bigger picture, like Sherry is seeing the bigger picture. So it's that he's starting to understand maybe what was really happening, and it wasn't them trying to hurt him; it was them trying to help him. And see, but that's just recently that he's discovering that. Yeah, when he began thinking more about it. So, really, the movie was kind of depicting, it's like, how it must have been from his point of view at the time, having the experience. It was fear, total well, fear. We know fear mm-hmm. can really color a lot of things, and fear is not real, mm-hmm. but it makes things distorted. But still, the movie, they said Hollywood got a hold of it and just turned it into a horror movie. And that wasn't the way it really was at all. But he thinks now, this is one thing that was good about his talk, because he was going into the way he looks at it now. And he says now when he looks at it, he thinks they were trying to help him because when he went out there, you know, he walked out into this field, there was the loggers, they were in the truck. And they were doing the logging, and uh, he what shouldn't even have been out there. He just walked out in the middle of the field because they saw this light and saw this thing out there. And so he was hit by this blast. And it was almost like he wasn't supposed to be in that. And that they took him on board, really, to help him. Because he said with the feelings he had of being suffocated and all of that, which came out in the movie was them trying to get his heart started and trying to get him back breathing again because it was quite a jolt to his body. It was essentially electrocuted. Yeah. 
And that's why they, he was gone missing for five days. And they came up with the idea that his the other people on the, the loggers had, had killed him. They said he figured he got into a fight out there with them, and they killed him. And that's why they couldn't find his body. And if you saw the movie, the sheriff was convinced that they had murdered him. But then it pops up, well, they thought it was some kind of a conspiracy thing that they planned this whole thing. And all of them ended up taking lie detector tests, and it was proven to be real story. But that's the mindset. This was a country town out in the middle of nowhere, and we're very familiar with the mindset in a country town. Uh, they would never have understood any of this. Well, it was in the 70s, too. You have to yeah. always remember the time. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know a lot about UFOs. That shows how far we've come. Yeah, that's one thing we was noticing with our conference is how far we've come. The things we were talking about now, we couldn't even understand back when I first got into the UFO research. And I've noticed, too, that a lot of the things that I was writing about in my first books when I started the UFO research in the 80s, a lot of the concepts and theories I was coming up with, they were making fun of and kind of ridiculed and put them down. But now they are being accepted as scientific fact. Now, when did that ever happen? While you were sleeping. <laughs> Because all the theories I've come up with of the seeding of the planet Earth <clears throat> and the manipulation of the DNA and the parts about uh, time, the condensation of time and there is no time, all of those now are being accepted as fact and the quantum physics is backing up a lot of my research. But when I started out, oh, they laughed at me and said, well, this is impossible. So that does show we have come a long way. And the audience said they're ready for the new stuff. They said, we don't want the same old, same old. We, we're past that. We don't want Space 101 anymore. We want to go into the new things. There's a lot of new advances out there, new findings. So that's what we're trying to keep ahead of it and bring the speakers in who have that information. But... Um, Travis said he has been approached by uh, people in Hollywood who want to make the movie over again and do it in the way that he thinks it happened. But he said he was also approached by companies that want to do it in the horror way again and bring in more monsters. Yeah. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. But it will probably will be made over in the way he saw it. And he saw them the same way we see the ETs as very benevolent. Right. That's how he sees them now. Yeah, he At sees At the time, he was, he was very afraid. Mm -hmm. And then he, he got a lot of ridicule and a lot of things in the early days when he first went on television and talk shows. He gave him a hard time. And he dropped off of the, what do you want to cut? Not off the map, but he dropped out of the. Uh, media for quite a while because he didn't like it. He didn't like the exposure, and he didn't like uh, being noticed like that in the it's publicity. It's not fun being under a microscope. <laughs> mm, it's yeah. not. You know, we know that. Right. And so we like being back here in the hills. <laughs> but um, so he he dropped off of the, out of the uh, site for a while because he didn't want that. But now he's coming back in. And there's a lot of new things happening with him. And I thought he gave a very good talk. Very good. He was very believable. Mm -hmm. so there was two experiencers there. So I'm going to be looking to see if I can find some more for next year. The books we've published, and we have over 50 authors, we don't have very many that are about UFO experiences. No. That's why I chose her, uh, Sherry's book, because it was very believable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But anyway, I'm now trying to line up for next year because it'll be here before we know it. Okay. But we also had Nick Pope. And I thought I was going to have to bring him from England because that's where he was from originally. <laughs> and he worked with the, uh, the British intelligence. 
in the Ministry of Defense in, in London. So he was very much involved in all of that. So I wanted him to come because every UFO conference and every time we're talking to people about UFOs, they're always saying, when is the government going to disclose what they know? It's no longer a secret that we know the government knows more than they're saying. They said for years they didn't want to tell anybody because they were afraid of people panicking. And I think we're way past that. But that's what they were afraid of. People would panic if they said the UFOs are real and they're VTs out there. They also said that it would destroy religion. And I don't know how they figure that. I don't know, but that would be a good thing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why the government wouldn't want it. I mean, they, they can't control people if they know that there's something else out there. Yeah. There's a bigger picture. So the government doesn't want it. It would make people start questioning. They don't want you to ask questions. Right. But that was, um, we know they know more than they're saying. They've known it for years. I'm in the middle of all this, so we know a lot more than the other average person does. But people are always saying, when is the government going to release their findings when they're going to have disclosure? Well, Nick Pope is right at the head of all of that. He's right in the middle of it. And uh, he was talking about the, what the British government has released. They've turned over, he said, 55,000 pages of documents dealing with UFOs. And he said it's going to take a long time to go through all of that. But from what he could see already, there's amazing cases that it's going to be very hard to disprove. It's like they just dumped it all at once. Now they're going to take people to have to go through and sort it all out. So 55,000 pages of documented evidence of UFOs. From and what From what country? That was England. Okay. And then I saw him on CNN when he was in Canada, and this has only been during this last year, and where he was at a meeting they had with the uh, Ministry of Defense and the Parliament in Canada, and they were releasing all of their documents. And they came out on CNN, these officials, and were saying, we know it's real. We know there's other beings out there. And how can people deny it? How can there not be? So they're admitting it, and they have also dumped a lot of their records. This is going to be a big job for somebody, but thank goodness for computers. They probably couldn't have done this years ago if they would release all that one time. It's taken people. <laughs> yeah, have people a long time to sort through all of that. But also, those are the two main ones that Nick Pope is, in, is uh, connected with, and he knows about theirs. But he's also investigated that Russia is releasing their files, Brazil, uh, China. We know China released theirs, one of the first ones. And there's some other countries, too, Netherlands. So it's almost like the U.S. is the Johnny-come-lately. It's the last one to finally admit that it is real and to start uh, releasing their files. They're like the last one. So how are they going to keep saying it's not real if all the other countries in the world are releasing their files for people to know about? Right. So his was a very interesting talk because he's right in the forefront. You can't say he's a kook, and he's even involved with the intelligence agencies over there. Huh. I think that's even something he said, is that people, you, most of the people in this field are not kooks. They're very intelligent, <laughs> um, believable people, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's hard for I mean, at one time, there may have been, it may have been easy for people to cast it off and, and, and spread a lot of disinformation, but it's, it's hard to now. So. You tell them what happened when uh, somebody, was someone in Hollywood contacted you? Wanted to help oh. know about the U.S. law investigation. Oh, some reality. This, this gives you an idea, but that's to show you how, the, how Hollywood works. In the, in the media. Um, they... Apparently, and this may be a show that they're working on, it must be a show they're working on, a reality show, 
where they, I guess, will be, I'm trying to remember the exact wording of it, someone that is into UFOs and, like, watches the skies and is trying investigator. to... Investigator. Yeah. Just, just not necessarily an investigator, but somebody that's really interested. That's kind of an impression I got. It might be an investigator, but... Anyway, but and, and that would be fine, okay? We know a lot of people that are into UFOs and are watching for them all the time and, and also, also investigators. But no, let's, <clears throat> let's have it have to be someone from the country who has a long, shaggy beard, who, um, you know, lives out in the boonies and, and these kinds of things. It's like, you know... <laughs> what was the name they used? Uh, um, like, a, oh, the, the guy that had the bear. Um, Grizzly Adams. Grizzly Adams type person. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that kind of a mm-hmm. character. And they said, Did, do we know anybody like that? Uh, so I told them, I said, I know <laughs> lots of people that are investigators and that are interested in UFOs. They said interested in UFOs. You know, all these things. But I don't know that I necessarily know a Grizzly Adams type character who lives in the country and watches the sky. And that, you know, it's like, it just shows you they just want it from the certain angle. They're not going to. You know, the field is interesting enough on its own. Why do we have to do it with this character? It, that would make it unbelievable that it's got to be somebody back lost in the hills and cut off from reality to believe in these things. But <laughs> you said, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that one. No. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And we had Linda Wooten Howe, and she comes every year. She's been there almost as long as I have, because I've been in from day one of the whole 27 years. She came in about 24, 25 years in, after we started. And she's always coming up with different information, because she is a reporter, and she's always an investigator. She always comes up with something different every year. So she spoke a lot about things like that, and she was talking about these sites in Turkey where they found the, uh, the digging up these buildings. It was interesting, too, because that has been very recent that they even discovered them, pillars. And on the pillar thing were animals that nobody knows what kind of animals they are. I think that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. What are these animals that are carved into these pillars? How were they able to date them? Oh yeah, they're like twelve thousand years old, way back before the pyramids. There wasn't even any people living in that area at the time, so they said, "Who carved these?" And they're absolutely perfect pillars. They're square, and they had these. Uh, I'm going to say statues. They call relief. I think whenever it's carved down. Yeah, Pillar and it, it sticks out, but they can't figure out what the animals are. And even if they could, where did they come from? They certainly from that uh, area. And there's a whole lot of this whole city they haven't even uncovered yet. So I, that's always interesting. That's why I like to watch ancient alien shows and even America on Earth. We don't know. What's going on? Out we there. don't have a clue. <laughs> They've always thought, well, the scientists, the historians know everything that's ever happened, and they don't. We're constantly uncovering new information. And as an investigator, I'm so curious on this, and I love history. I love those kind of shows when they're coming up with something. We have no idea where this came from, we have no idea where it is. That's exciting, I think. <clears throat> Um, well, then we had George Nury, which was funny, because, um, you know, if everybody knows about Coast to Coast, we had him at our show last year, the um, Transformation Conference, and so he wanted to say, can I come to your UFO conference? So we brought him here, and he, he's a funny guy. He likes to cut up and make jokes. He's an excellent investigator, but, I mean, uh, in, interviewer. What do I mean, investigator? He just <laughs> interviews people, and he always keeps that, um, well, what's the word I want to know? He, he never, 
it goes to the skeptics as well as the believers, he's got a curiosity. Objectivity? That'd be a good word to put. But he didn't have a regular lecture. He just took uh, calls, you know, people from the audience. That's what he used to do in answering questions from call-in. But uh, we had a surprise. Uh, we found out about this group of people, and I want to tell you about them because somebody out there may want to ask this group for their functions. We were at, uh, I was given a class over in Springdale this last year, and these guys came out. They were there performing for a teenage uh, function. For a comic, a comic book. Was that what it was? Yeah. I thought it was teenagers. <laughs> anyway, uh, these guys are, are called the 501. The 501st. A legion. Mm -hmm. And it's a group of, of men and women who are volunteers. And it goes back to George Lucas' Sky Wars character. Star Wars. You can tell you, you watch all these things. I do. Where did I get Sky Wars? I have no idea. Well, that word just slipped in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I know mm -hmm. Star, Star Wars. But it's a group that are they're based on those characters. And they have to make their own costumes. And they're strictly volunteer. And they go everywhere. They, uh, they come in their costumes. And they go to children's hospitals, they go to schools, any kind of function. And they're not paid. Any money they get goes to charity. So we asked them if they would come, and they came dressed up like the stormtroopers on Star Wars. And it was so funny. The audience got such a uh, kick out of that. And we had them bring George Lurie in as though he was being arrested and escorted down the aisle. And they thought that was so funny. <clears throat> but if anybody out there is interested in this, you can find them online, 501, Bible uh, First, Legion. And you can, they're all over the United States, and they appear at all kinds of functions. If you're interested in having something that's out of the ordinary. And their costumes were very authentic. Very. And everybody loved it. So we had that, and we had them bring George Nury to the stage, and, and they went along with it and played the part. So that was really good. <laughs> then we had Anthony Cataldo came from Hollywood because he's involved in a movie. It's almost done now about UFOs that he is making. And it's going to be the feature motion picture. It's not a documentary. And the movie is called 701. Now, they call it that because back in the days of Blue Book, remember Project Blue Book way back when the UFO investigations were just beginning, and this is when the skeptics were all saying there wasn't any such thing. And the Project Blue Book was all the first cases, and they had, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of cases there were, but they said they had disproved them all, saying it was, you know, lights in the sky or something else. Uh, one time, you know, they used to say, way back, they talked about it being swamp gas and airplanes and the planet Venus and Jupiter. They always could identify them as something. And they identified them all except 701 of cases that they could not disprove. So that's why they called the movie 701. And he's made a movie out of that, and he went back and investigating a lot of old cases. And there were some I've never heard of before. One was, he doesn't mind us telling some of these things because we're not spoiling the ending or anything because he was he was talking about this at the conference. Um, there was a case in Zimbabwe. This was in 20 years ago. That would have been 80s, I guess. 94. <clears throat> in Zimbabwe, there was this school... And this UFO was right out there over the schoolyard for a long, long time. And all the kids came out and stood there and watched it. And I don't know why the teachers weren't out there. They were in a meeting. That's why the kids were outside. 
of the recess or something. It, they were in a teacher meeting. Mm -hmm. So all the kids were out in the schoolyard watching this. It, it was right over the um, schoolyard. And it was there for a long time. <laughs> and afterwards, they had the actual footage shot where they interviewed the kids. And this was done by John Mack when he was investigating. And they had him come over there and talk to these kids as a psychiatrist. And he said they weren't lying. They just reported what they saw. And they all draw pictures of what they saw. And I don't know how many there was that they, they talked with. There was a whole lot of these kids. And you see the original interviews with them. And then now, 20 years later, they wanted to find these kids again. And we were in Hollywood when they were doing some shooting out there, and they brought some of them over. There was about five of them, I found. Yeah. It's interesting that the boys didn't want to be interviewed. It was only the girls that were brave enough yeah, to do it. the girls that came forward so far. Okay. So they brought them to Hollywood and interviewed them now as adults. And it's very interesting, and they're very believable young girls because we spoke to them when we were out there. Okay, is there a caller there? Hi. Yeah, hello? Hi, this is Scott from San Diego, California. Hi, Scott. Hi. Hi, you two. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, diving into both of your material uh, in the last uh, several months. It's been a, an awesome journey. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I have to thank you both. Um, and um, I, um, my wife was like, wow, you're buying every single book. I'm getting every single book. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, went through the archives, started at the very beginning to hear the not so much a formatted show, but just Dolores telling her story, how everything began and happened. It's, it's just been an unbelievable experience. And I just want to thank you both for everything that you're doing. Um, oh. And... I heard a lady on one of the calls, I've listened to so many, I don't know which one, but I, I heard a lady that was talking about something that, that I've been experiencing, and it's, um, it's, it's happened in the, just the last, I'd say the last two years, and at first I didn't really think it was anything, but it happened when I began to learn to step out of time and, you know, just stop wearing a watch and just um, in, enjoy life and, and be in the present. And, and whenever I did walk into a room and I look at a, I look at a clock, it would, uh, it would be, uh, you know, it, it started out as 911, and I mm. saw that quite often, and then it went to 111 a lot, and then 555 and 333, and I mean, I only look at the clock four or five times a day, max, and, you know, it start, kept happening, kept happening, and I'm, I'm like, okay, there's communication here, and I heard you speak of this before, and uh, even like 1234, even clocks that aren't even having the correct time, even at the gas pump. And and uh, until I found you, I was really starting to wonder. Um, now I'm beginning to understand, and I just wanted to share that with you guys and see if you had anything to to uh, to let me know. Yeah, that's that's super. Um, yeah, we've had people say, "Am I going crazy because I'm noticing all these numbers?" Now those are messages just yeah. for you. Yeah, and you're, um, you know, what I'm getting is they're just trying, because like you said, so you're devouring all this information. So this is a new path that you've taken, and it's, uh, it's just all the signs and messages that you're on the right track, and add a boy. I'm hearing add a boy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, I agree. All right. Well, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I'm having so much fun with all your material. I'm, I'm uh, four chapters into your book. Um, and, uh, and, um, just, just having, having a blast, your book, Julie, and, and having a blast. So oh. thanks so much for everything. Sorry to ask a question off topic, but I, I was oh, so no. excited to hear you were live. I said, I got to yeah. call in. Thank you so much for calling in and thank you so much for, for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> keep exploring so because that's what it's all about. Don't be afraid. If people think you're crazy, they just, they're not developed yet. We just feel sorry for yeah, them, uh, you know. <laughs> absolutely. Thank, thank you for that. Absolutely, yeah. That's. I remember in your book with Jesus and the Essenes, you, you spoke about how that was one of the lessons that 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 he had to learn was the you know the the criticism and the 
and so forth. And, uh, you know, that's, that's nothing new, and, and uh, it's so confirming. And, and thank you both again. Thanks for taking my call. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's a matter of just walking in your truth. Mm-hmm. Well, we found those numbers when you're seeing repeating numbers. It's your guides and guardians. Mm-hmm. Guardian angels and your guides are giving you messages. And may we not understand that consciously, but that other part of our mind is picking up the messages. Uh, Julie, you said when you see those numbers, it's like your guide giving you a hug. Right. It's they're talking to you, and it's all, a lot of times it's just to let you know you're not alone. You know, they are there. And the biggest thing, I think, with that is just recognizing that they are a message, because that's your first step to understanding how this communication works and how uh, you are bigger than, than you, and this is how you can work with your guidance system, is number one, acknowledge that you have one, and that's it. Numbers all over the place, you start seeing them. If you open up to that, those messages and understand that they are messages, then you'll open up to other things that are happening. Mm-hmm. They're just pushing it. Oh, man. Time. It's just a awesome. coincidence, you know. Right. But, awesome. Um, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Okay. But, well, you know, every time I'm going to do a conference or I uh, speak at a conference or do a class or anything, I've seen the same numbers everywhere, 11, 1122. And then I know it's them telling me, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> so you learn to recognize the communication. Okay, somebody else is there. Hello? Yes. Hello? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. What's your name? My name is Carlos. Um, I am calling you from Venezuela. Oh, very nice. From Venezuela. Oh, you're getting us all the way down there? Uh, Yes, loud and clear. Wow. Wow. Okay. Do you have a question? Dolores, uh, (laughs) yes. uh, First, I'd like to say it's with much love and gratitude that I hear your voice. uh, I know of you of probably 20 years now, and I thank you very much for everything that you've done for everyone. Having said that, I'd like to say, uh, ask you, uh, both of my parents died within the past three years, and I was wondering if through regression I might be able to speak with them again. Is that possible? I've had it happen, but it just depends on, you know, I don't have any control over it, but I have had it happen, and it's usually been unexpected when it does happen. But... Um, one thing, you don't have to worry about them. They're in a beautiful, wonderful place. But, but do you want to speak to them just okay. to ask them some questions or what? Well, it, it was, it's, it's one of those things. I understand that they are somewhere else now, but it, it, it would be nice to just say hello and, and, and ask, how you doing? Very simply. <laughs> but you can do that through meditation, too. You know, I understand. You, you can I feel. Oh, you. Who are you trying to? <laughs> you can feel them. I can feel that you can feel them. Are you okay. afraid to acknowledge that? I. Uh, I. I'm sorry. I. You. Okay. I. Okay. I'm picking this up off of you. You can feel them. You can feel their presence. Uh, Are you afraid to acknowledge that? I used to to live in the U.S. I only came here for a month because my father started getting sick. I ended up living here in their house. And that's how I'm calling you from Venezuela. But uh, um, I I, 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 I would say the fact... The fact that I'm living at their house, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I do I do send them around, but okay, yeah, I was so just that's, wondering that's if I could talk to them. You're rationalizing that. It's actually them because you are in their energy space, mm-hmm. and so, but, but it, it is more than that. It's more than just being in their house. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's how you're rationalizing it, but it's actually they're around. You um, just okay. acknowledge that. They are right there, and you can just talk to them. 
And then if you start hearing things, or you may even have dreams, or you might feel a presence in the room, that's them. And understand. Like she said, I will be uh, more mindful of, of that. Absolutely, yeah. But it's, again, it's about acknowledging. We, we don't, you know, we want it to be these big ground-shaking things, and it's just acknowledge the little things when they happen, and then that will open up to more. <laughs> and then you will, understand. you will see understand. what I'm talking about, because you're already feeling them. I can feel that you're feeling them. And it's not just because you're in their house. It's because they're there. So, well, you, you so probably understand. had things happening, very subtle things, and you're probably saying, oh, that's just a coincidence. But it is actually them well, communicating with you because uh, it's not, like she said, it's not <laughs> anything sudden. It's just very subtle. The it, it, it is true. It is true. What? It is true. So, so basically, to to to, to finish the topic, and uh, it, it 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 in other words, there, there is communication happening. It's just that I haven't been aware or paying attention to the new way of commun communicating with them. Correct. Mm -hmm. Very correct. Uh, I like the way you put that. The new way of communicating. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> they haven't you. gone very. Far. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> but do you medit <laughs> Thank you to both. Thank you again, Dolores. I, I love you, and thank you very, very much. Okay, muchas gracias. <laughs> but that's a good point. I like how he worded that, because that, that's really how, if you look at it, they, they didn't go anywhere. No. They just shifted to another dimension, and they're mm. still there. And so we just have to shift how we communicate and be open to more ways of communicating. And just by being quiet, mm -hmm. even when you're going to sleep at night and thinking about them, you can talk to them, mm -hmm. and it might feel their presence, or you may feel an answer come in. But just acknowledge it and say, thank you, I'm glad you're here. And then that will open you to more. Mm -hmm. That's that can't be emphasized enough. Do something. Acknowledge what little bit you do. I mean, anything. And then that will open you up to more. And that's how we develop our ability. Mm -hmm. You have to acknowledge what's there, and then you'll get more. <laughs> well, people are expecting it to be grandiose, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, a lot of times they do see them. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're going to sleep at night and you're in that, that state. People have seen them in their room and things, and oh, uh, you can communicate then. But don't expect it to happen like that. It may just be a feeling. I've had some people talk about maybe the father smoked a pipe, and they'll smell uh, that pipe tobacco in the house, even though nobody else is there. Things like that. Other times it means the smell of roses. You know, our senses are all acting all the time. They're all, they're communicating with us in different ways. The senses, one of them is smell. And sometimes you'll just feel, because you know what someone's energy feels like. You might feel like someone just walked in the room and you look and, well, there's nobody there. But you felt it on another level. You know, I mean, and it may disappear as soon as you see there's nobody there. Okay, but... But just acknowledge the fact that you did feel a presence, and and it, and it probably felt familiar to you. Mm -hmm. Those are all ways of of experiencing. Because if there was love there, uh, they're going to try to communicate in some way, just to let you know I didn't go anywhere. I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and. Um, even if there wasn't a good relationship, you can talk to them and just say, well, I'm sorry for anything I did that hurt you, and i just asking you to forgive me, and I want to send you on your way with love. There's never anything to be afraid of. But the main thing is just to, to acknowledge they're there and that you love them and they love you. Right. So... People are so afraid of these things they don't understand. I had one story I guess I could tell. He asked about regression. 
But I had a woman who came to see me, and usually I go into past lives, and we go to where we have therapy and things. And all she was talking about was her sister who had died, and she was still grieving over her, even though it, I think it had been a while, a couple of years, and she was still grieving over her sister. And we talked for the whole time that I'd been with them, and nothing would come out. You know, she just kept, I mean, when I'm saying nothing, she kept going back to that, how much she missed her sister. And I never know what's going to come out whenever we do a session. The SC, as I call it, the, the subconscious part we communicate, takes you to where you're supposed to go, the most appropriate place. So in this case, when she went into the session, from the descriptions, I knew she was on the spirit side. She was in the midst of a beautiful garden with the most beautiful flowers you can possibly imagine. They talk about the colors are like no colors on earth. And she was in the middle of this garden, and she saw someone walking toward her through the flowers. And when she got close enough to her, she saw it was her sister. And she looked healthy and beautiful. And so she was talking to her sister, and she said, what happened? We thought you were getting better. And she'd been in the hospital. We thought you were getting better. What happened? And the sister told her, it was my time. I finished what I was supposed to be doing, and it was time to go on. Now let me go. It's nothing to grieve about. You'll be here, too, someday. <clears throat> and then she said, before I go, I want you to see somebody else. And there was her mother and father came walking through the flowers toward her, looking young and healthy and happy. And they were talking to her, and they said, you can see we're happy. This is a beautiful place. Don't grieve for us. It's wonderful over here. And she said, you know, just enjoy life, and one day we'll all be back together again. Well, that was what this client needed. So I never know what they're going to get. But I don't expect this every time. It just happens. And we've heard from practitioners, too, that it happens. If the person needs if to that's get that what, closure or whatever, then they will get that. If that's what they need, then the, the SC, the subconscious part, will bring them what they need. I had another woman who was having heart problems. And she was thinking about they were going to do surgery. And she was the same way. She, instead of going to a past life, she went to the spirit side. And as she's standing there, her father comes toward her, and he had died. But her father and her had had a very bad relationship. He was not, a, not a, we were there when she needed him. It was a very, not a good relationship. So the father came up to her. And he was asking her to forgive him for what he had done. Because from the other side, they can see the bigger picture. They see everything. And they know if they've made mistakes. Because there is no such thing as good or bad and evil. It's all experiences and lessons. So anyway, the father then, he said, put his hand inside her body to her heart. And he was massaging the heart. And he said, I'm sorry, I broke your heart. And that was the cause of her problems with her heart. So he was doing that and began to beat normally. And she was healed anyway. So we never know what's going to happen in these sessions. They're really miracles. But in that case, the father needed to come, and they both needed closure. So we never know what's going yeah, to happen. And that shows it doesn't have to happen within the life either. Yeah, it can it happen. Can, That's why you can, if somebody has passed on, you can still heal whatever. If you don't like how things were, if you don't have to leave it to, quote, karma to, to come back around. You can fix it now. Yeah, as long as you realize it and you forgive them and forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. Those are very, very important things to do. But this is part of what I teach anyway, and it's not easy <clears throat> for some people. A lot of them just can't let go. But in this case, his parents are right there with him. 
and he'll understand that. <clears throat> oh, he does. I could feel them. They were and it there. Was, it wasn't a house thing. It was a. It was an actual them thing. If you're in the house, you are around their energy. But it didn't feel like that. It felt like their actual presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just have one more of our speakers to talk about because we're coming up to the top of the hour here. I brought this man from Turkey. His name is Hakton McDougan. And I've known him for several years. And last year in March, we were over in Istanbul. He brought me over there, and I did some um, uh, two days of, of workshops over there. But I brought him over because he's one of the foremost investigators and researcher of UFO in Turkey. And he has the only UFO museum in Europe. And he brought a lot of pictures and slides of UFOs. From Turkey. From Turkey. And so the audience said later it shows it's all over the world. And we know that. It's not just an American kooky thing or English kooky right. thing. It's all over the world. And he had one of the last ones he showed. What was that one he showed? A hundred of them in the air. Oh, and they called it a fleet. I mean, it, but these pictures were phenomenal. Amazing. A whole, he said a hundred at least yeah, in the air. Yeah, hundreds, I think. It was huge. It was, it was covered. The sky was covered with them. <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> and the last one he showed was a close-up of one, and that had been investigated by all the experts over there in Turkey, and uh, it was not a, a computer Photoshop shop thing they do. It was not fake. It was real photograph, and it's acknowledged as real. So when I do these conferences, I try to bring people in from all over that are experts. And have something different. Something different to contribute. Okay, we're coming to the end. We're going to be focusing on, in June, uh, we're going to be having our ninth transformation conference here in um, in Springdale, Arkansas. It's different than the UFO. We try to keep the two separate from each other. The UFO is one thing, and then the meta- other one is a metaphysical conference. Yeah, and I have issues with that, but that's another story. Somewhere. I know. Because, <laughs> because they're not two different things. <laughs> well, but people were afraid when I took it over last year I was going to combine, and they really don't want yeah, to. There's, there's ways to do it without. But I remember, a lot of you might remember John Mack, the psychiatrist that risked his career when he went out with investigating UFOs and doing hypnosis. And the first time he ever spoke was way back. He came to this UFO conference here in, in Eureka Springs. And it was fascinating. And one thing he said, you will never understand the UFO phenomena until you understand metaphysics. Which, case in point, why the two need to pull together. <laughs> and when he said that, he got a standing ovation. Right. So people, for the first time an expert, especially a psychiatrist, acknowledged the two are intertwined, which I know from my work. They are intertwined. I can't separate them. That's why in my latest book, it's all weaving over together. And that's where we're growing to. People are starting to understand that, mm-hmm. I, I think. It's just things But then we have, we have a few that come, and they just want to stick with the old things, you know. We don't no longer have to be proved that UFOs are real. We know they're real. That's why it's going to be difficult to keep these two separate. <laughs> I know, but I try to just have one be UFOs, and the one in June is uh, mostly a showcase for our authors, our new authors especially, and to give them a chance to lecture. So anybody interested in that, we're recovering from the UFO one, but now we're going into the Transformation Conference. This will be our ninth year. And if you're interested in that, of course, how can they get a hold of it? Um, well, the website is transformation-conference.com, and it'll have all the information. You can see who all the speakers are, and we have a lot of workshops happening this year. Um, and you can see everything about it. It's, and the dates are June 20th to the 22nd. And Three days. Mm-hmm, and then we have workshops, like three days of workshops around it as well. 
Who's the man the keynote were bringing him over from Spain? Robert Baval. Very well known. He was on Ancient Aliens. Right. Very excited to see him. He's, he's been really, really nice to work with, so I'm really excited to, uh, mm-hmm. to get to know him better. And Cherry Wilde's going to be there again because she's one of our authors. Absolutely. I mean, you you can't get enough of her. I mean, she's fantastic. <laughs> so, and, so, this, and this is going to come, she, she went so far. I mean, she did kind of start stepping over when the questions as far as the spiritual side, but she wanted to save all that information for this, this conference. conference. For the ones that wanted to keep it separate. So anyway, if you're interested in that conference that's in June, and contact our office. You want to call is 1-800-935-0045. Ours mostly done on the computer. And we're working on that now. And if you didn't get that website, um, there's a link to it on the uh, OzarkMT.com site. Uh, it may not be yet on the Dolores site, but it will be. Okay. Now, we won't be live next week. We're going to be in England. You know, we have an office in England, and we do have to go over there every once in a while. <laughs> well, wait, there's a concert we're attending, which you've probably heard of, the Saving Saving the Earth Ocean, um, but, uh, it's a benefit concert. But um, also, we're doing a workshop in London, a full-day workshop on the 27th. Okay. All right, well, we're going to have to sign off, so we won't be live next week. We'll be in London. Okay. Well, good night, everyone, and thanks for listening. Make it great. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.